Hello again, witches, seekers, and friends, and thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, the show where I do a little ranting, raving, and wand waving. I'm your host, Kate, a proud witch, a former doula, and a French Canadian. And today I'm going to be talking about how all of these identities intersect. Just a little bit. Mostly witches and doulas, though. <laughs> Bonjour mes amis! <laughs> Hi friends! Today we're talking about a profession and kind of life mission that's very common in witchy and pagan circles, which is midwifery, doulas, and, and birth work in general. Today is also National Acadian Day here in Canada, where we celebrate this super interesting and wonderful French-Canadian subculture from our eastern provinces, the Maritimes, known as Acadians. So a lot of people, especially since a lot of you are Americans, know that Quebec is kind of our hub of French Canadian culture here in Canada. But there is this whole separate Canadian culture called the Acadians on the East Coast, which I highly remember, highly recommend looking up. Um, unfortunately, I'm not here to drop a whole episode about Acadian spirituality or folk magic, if there is any. But if you are Acadian and you know of any and you want to talk to me, please just like email me. Um, but in a totally coincidental coincidence, my interest in doulas and midwives began with a fictional character who was a Cajun woman living in the eastern provinces of Canada in the 1800s in a book called The Birth House by author Amy McKay, who also wrote The Witches of New York and started that Witchy Wednesday hashtag. Neat. Uh, so Acadian culture and Cajun culture down in the South are so, so similar. And that's because they're all the same people. <laughs> Acadians out on the East were essentially blackballed by France and a lot of Canada in its form that it existed then. Uh, and a lot of them moved down to Louisiana and the South and they became the Cajun people down there. They mixed their French culture and their culture of living on the ocean with some of the more Southern and Appalachian cultures that lived down there. Plus, of course, all of the, the Haitian and the cultures of the people of color that lived down there. So, of course, some Cajuns came back up to Canada to reclaim their homeland. And from this, we now have this beautiful Acadian culture as we know it today. I'm going to be honest, I had actually forgotten <laughs> that today was National Acadian Day when I scheduled this episode for this date. But it seems so oddly fitting now. So, so wonderful. So I would really like to dedicate this episode to Amy McKay, the author, and her wonderful character of Miss B., my, my Cajun midwife. Bonne journée Acadienne Nationale à tous mes amis francophones, whether you are Acadian, Québécois, Métis, Français, Cajun, or anything in between. Yay! I am Québécois French, if, if you're wondering. I'm not, <laughs> not fortunate enough to be Acadian. They have some really cool slang, but I do love my, my French-Canadian heritage. I love French-Canadian heritage in Canada in general, so I'm really happy it's National Acadian Day today. So doing an episode about doulas and midwives has kind of been floating around in my brain since I started this podcast, but after I recorded my episode, Not Every Goddess Has a Sacred, sacred Womb, and I got all this awesome feedback from that episode, I kind of stuck it on the back burner because I didn't feel like I needed to come in and, and, <laughs> and talk about wombs and magic after I did that. But this summer, or I guess this, this year, this idea has come up a lot in a bunch of tiny little coincidences and signs, which of course I love as a wit. And I decided it has been enough time for me to talk about the issue of reproductive focus in witchcraft culture and feminism from this other angle. So if you've never listened to the show before and are, and are thinking, oh great, she's going to talk about her uterus for the next hour, uh, I recommend going back and checking that out either before or after you you listen to this episode so that you see I do not worship at the altar of, of the sacred womb now, but in doing so so long ago, that was really an integral part of my life as a feminist and even my, my witch practice. So let's back up just a little bit. Much of this episode is inspired by the book or pamphlet, uh, Mitch's Witches, Midwives, and Nurses by B Barbara Ehrenreich and Deidre English, which was released by the Feminist Press at the City University of New York in 1973, which is a year before Roe v. Wade in the United States made abortion legal for quote unquote everyone. I originally bought this book back in 2009 as part of my doula certification course. It was just on the reading list. And today, it's one of only two books from that time that are still on my shelves. And they have a very prominent place 
with my other books on the history of women in witchcraft. They're, they're right in my witchcraft section in my bookshelf. So this year, this year I reviewed Basic Witches and Witches, Sluts, Feminists, both of which referenced this book. And I got really excited because those are very modern books for modern witches, younger witches, contemporary witches. And I always thought this was one of those books that was kind of on the fringe. I thought it was just a book for doulas and midwives, but I'm starting to see how much it's influencing modern witches. And I'm very excited about it. This summer, I also read a non-witchy title called The Story of Jane by Laura Kaplan. This is the story of the, the feminist underground abortion collective in Chicago in the last four years, again, before Roe v. Wade in the 1970s there. So not only did witches, midwives, and nurses come up in the book, but the women of Jane bought and distributed copies, not only so that their activists and the other women in the organization could read it, but a lot of the people receiving abortions in order to raise their consciousness and connect them more to this this idea of women in medical care and, and women's reproductive freedom. Throughout the story of Jane, which I so recommend, by the way, if you live in Windsor, Ontario, it's at the library. and I recommend you check it out. It was amazing. Um, every time the reasons that those people were motivated to work in abortion, even though it was legal and there was tons of risks, every time those came up, it was like reading a transcript from my doula cert certification course, which I also took in New York, by the way, um, from all of the other people there. So when I got there, and this, it was a huge group, by the way, lots of lots of different people, everyone shared the reasons why they were there. Everyone. And there were reasons like, because it's everyone's right to have safe medical care, because women need to do something concrete to, to help other women when other people won't, because they're oppressed, uh, no matter the cost, and because the poorest and most oppressed of us are usually the ones that suffer the most or are most at the hands of the medical profession through you know, ignorance, because they're just not taught about their bodies and and how medicine works, really. All of those reasons were from the story of Jane, and all of those reasons came up during my doula certification course. And when I was reading that, like, I got a chill down my spine. It was all of the same reasons I had gotten into it and why other people had gotten into it. It was amazing. So birth work throughout human civilization and time has always been on the fringes of society, even though society, of course, wouldn't exist without birth. So working with birth and reproductive rights and abortion is absolutely a revolutionary act, no question. It took it coming up three times in three different totally amazing and inspirational books, plus a couple of random documentaries I found on channels I didn't even know my TV got about health and the health movement and women's rights. Before I relented when was like, fine, I'll do an episode about doulas. This is getting kind of absurd. It's just been, it's been hammering at me for months. So some of this is going to be kind of personal. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, magic and medicine and how magic and medicine were separated, how they came together, how they flipped and magic became medicine and medicine became magic and where we are now and why doulas, midwives and other people who work specifically with uh, birth or women's health or reproductive rights or any of that stuff, why they are so closely tied to witches and to witchcraft. So as I said, my own interest in becoming a doula was sparked by The Birth House, which again, <laughs> highly recommend. It's like my favorite book of all time. And it was sparked mostly because I literally had no idea that people still had natural home births in North America. I had no idea I never knew. Afterwards, I, I did a lot of research. I had to go online and look this up. Like, are people actually giving birth at home with midwives still? And they are. <laughs> they really, really are. In my research, I discovered not just modern mid midwives, but doulas. And the real reason that I wanted to get involved because was because, A, to me, this seemed so wild, so revolutionary, just such an inherently... Um, helpful and feminist action to be there for someone while they're bringing a whole new person into this world. And it also offered birthing people options, choices, and information. Basically, all of the most precious resources in the world, which the recognized medical established didn't. You know, there's, there's this idea where the doctor has the knowledge and you're just the patient and you need to just 
take the information from that the doctor gives you and not question it. And I've never liked that. I don't like not questioning things ever. So doulas, which basically exist to question the recognized medical establishment, I mean, I was hooked. I was hooked. Almost two years later, I had saved up enough money to attend a course in New York City, and I spent five of the most amazing and important days of my entire life alone in New York City, for the most part, uh, kind of watching as my entire life just changed. I very much consider this moment to be my actual honest to God feminist awakening, and it included me sitting in a room... <laughs> full of hippie moms from all different cities and backgrounds and ethnic groups talking about their vagina and learning to conduct an actual pelvic exam on an actual stranger, which again is another thing they mentioned in the story of Jane. And I was like, hey, I did that too. Uh, <laughs> I never thought I'd get there or I'd be there or that would be something I would be doing or that would affect me so much. And it seems like a whole other life and a whole other person now. But I also see something else that I got out of it that I didn't really realize at the time. I've mentioned before that my relationship with my own mother and her family, which is very filled with women, she's got a million sisters, uh, is very strange. There's a lot of like abuse and trauma and all sorts of stuff generations back to unpack there. And I didn't know it at the time, but my entire life, that negative association I had with women, with motherhood, babies, and even like female friendships and relationships, sisterhood even, had influenced just like just just such a huge chunk of my identity. I had no idea. Uh, I've never wanted kids. And although I still don't now, uh, I know the reason I started feeling that way was because of that attachment from from women and from moms. I also never got a sex talk from my parents ever. It's so weird. I, I didn't realize it until like in the last few years. So bless all my teachers and the internet and my own drive to learn and be prepared because there's a lot of information there. It's not like I got nothing. But there was still so much missing from my sexual education, so much info I needed, stuff that most other women and, and girls of my age had learned from grown women, whether it was their moms, their teachers, their aunts, their grandmothers, their sisters, whatever. I didn't have that stuff. So my doula course was the first time that I... I talked to other women about being a woman without anything being scary. And I just want to pause for a second. Uh, I'm going to use woman a lot, and I'm really relegating that to their reproductive stuff. And I don't want to sound, I don't want to sound shitty like that. Of course, you can be a woman without any of these reproductive parts. You can be a woman without ever giving birth or menstruating or all of that stuff. But womanhood was a, a big part of this experience, and it's a big part of the journey of midwives and doulas and witches was to change what it means to be a woman in society because, you know, women were awful witches and burned at the stake and, and shit like that. So I just want to reiterate that just in case. <laughs> um, so it, it was really interesting. Uh, the doula course was the first time a woman ever talked to me about the clitoris, literally. I'd never really thought about my clitoris other than, oh yeah, that thing works. That's pretty cool. So I... <laughs> I had nothing. Uh, I had very limited understanding of my menstrual cycles, which caused me a lot of distress. I mean, I had the worst periods and I was screaming and crying and freaking out and I was in a, so much pain. But after my doula course, with my greater understanding, I started to notice or thought I noticed that my period had changed. It was so much less of a big deal, so much more manageable, so much less painful, and my mood swings were not as bad as they had been. And then I realized that it hadn't changed at all. It was the same amount of days it has always been. My flow was the same, like all of that. My period didn't change. My perspective and my knowledge of menstruation changed. And it made it seem like my body had changed. It's, it's the brain. Brains are wild. Honestly, just wild. Before my doula course, I didn't really think about, I didn't think about sex all the way. I didn't think about who I had sex with. And I had a lot of really negative sexual experiences that I couldn't process or understand. And when I tried to talk to friends, especially female friends, like I said, I struggled, um, I couldn't really talk to them about it. And I got a lot of flack and pushback and a lot of people just didn't seem to realize what I was talking about. And I didn't even realize what I was talking about or worrying about. I couldn't understand it. But after the course, I started 
to notice how I had treated myself, how I treated my body, and how I let men treat me and my body. And I've always felt like this tough bitch full of girl power. You know, I'm a super spice girl for life. But but what I found after was a whole bunch of internalized hatred towards women and towards myself and my body and, you know, my reproductive organs and being a woman and all of the emotional stuff that was being a woman and all of the stereotypes and all of that stuff. The doula course dragged all of that stuff up and it was a really rough couple of years, I'll tell you what. But I needed it. I wouldn't trade the stuff that I learned or the women that I met or the things about myself I had to you know, struggle through for anything in the world. I started taking care of my own health. I started getting more regular pap tests. I started getting better doctors. I started demanding better of my doctors. I started asking questions of my doctors and of other women. I started talking to other people who menstruated about menstruating. I started talking to people who had kids about what it was like to have kids, birth kids, be a parent, all that stuff. Because I realized I just, I didn't know how it worked. I started noticing how being involved in this kind of fringe feminist community of doulas uh, changed the way people in society looked at me and treated me and talked to me. It's wild to think about now, but if I had never spent years talking about nothing but babies and menstrual blood, watching my friends give birth with my face a few feet from their actual genitals and touching another woman's cervix and then, you know, my own cervix, I would not be the not every goddess has a sacred womb touting witch that I am today. I really, really needed that at the time. And it, that's okay. I mean, if you need that too, it's totally okay. And I think I said this in not every goddess has a sacred womb. I, I, I hope I said this is that it's really okay to need this information. It's really okay to need a group of other people with uteruses to talk about your uterus with or whatever. Um, I don't think it's okay to take women who don't have the same reproductive organs or functions or whatever. I don't think it's okay to take them out of that equation at all. But I think it's okay to need that stuff as long as that's not the only way you look at womanhood forever. The doula course also reignited my interest in witchcraft, especially herbal witchcraft. Uh, Susan Weed's Wise Woman's Herbal for the Childbearing Year. <sighs> it's still one of my favorite books of all time. It's amazing. It totally called to me with its wild recipes and herbal drawings and warnings of ancient poisons and toxicity. It's such a legitimate book, but it seems like a witch book. There's a whole chapter on natural and herbal abortions and birth control. And it's still one of my favorite chapters of any book that I've ever read in my life. I didn't know any of that stuff, none of it. I didn't even have a proper understanding of how abortion worked. And I realized after that all of the stuff I knew about abortion came from very strictly pro-life teachers and classes and stuff. Uh, I, when I look back, uh, when I look back, I realize that I was not so anti-choice. I, I wasn't pro-life per se. I thought everyone should be able to do what they wanted, but I was not pro-abortion either. And that's obviously changed like a lot. So in the birth house, this local midwife was so, so witchy, even if she didn't say it. The whole town called her a witch and damn if she didn't have this cute little cabin in the woods full of drying herbs and bubbling salves and every kind of tea imaginable and these slightly cryptic half French, half English prayers and incantations and, and you know, lists of things that you need. Here's one of my favorites. Scissors, needles, sewing cotton, crochet hooks, scorched muslin, calendula salve, peroxide, cayenne, witch hazel bark, castor oil, ergot, jay's fluid, stop bleed, mother's tea, mandrake root, the balm of the bruised woman. Stand with your back to the wind. Draw three circles clockwise around the plant with a knife. Douse it with merry water. Turn west to uproot. Salva nos stella maris, save us, star of the sea. That's not even just witch witchcraft. I mean, that's hoodoo. <laughs> and suddenly my knowledge of witchcraft and herbs and witch history was like a huge asset and was a serious part of this profession. And not just because that's what I, you know, secretly really wanted. I wanted to be a professional witch forever. But it, it actually genuinely was a part of it. And not only was it in this fun pulp culture stuff, but books like Witches, Midwives and Nurses, which were recommended reading in my doula course, really solidified this idea that they were intrinsically connected. As I learned in the book, 
Uh, women healers have always been witches and vice versa. Even if they weren't actually self-proclaimed witches, they were wise women, apothecaries, herbal workers, cunning women, t tonic mixers, and doctors before doctors even existed. They were who everybody went to for all of their kind of healthcare needs. And this is mainly because, of course, <laughs> uh, women and women's health, uh, reproductive health, none of this was really seen as important by, you know, overarching male society. And birth was something that only women could deal with. You know, men weren't even there. They weren't there during the birth. If their wife or their partner or their sister or whatever was, was giving birth, the men and the boys were all gone. And it was all the women in town, including the midwives and her assistants and that, that birthing person's friends, were all called in. It was a huge thing. Menstruating women were sent to separate homes. Or if you've ever read The Red Tent, they were, they were just sent to separate homes tents and parts of the town or or village so that they wouldn't soil everything with their blood because it wasn't just it wasn't just like an unclean biological reason uh the blood of menstruation was seen to be like morally unclean i know it's so weird it still is have you noticed that like it's so wild to see people who don't know anything about menstruation think that menstrual blood is inherently more disgusting than every other kind of blood or like gross ooze that comes out of our bodies. Every Everything that oozes out of us is a little bit gross. None of it's more gross than any of the others. It's, it's really bizarre. <laughs> so living in the woods and gathering herbs and mixing potions and teas and tonics and poultices, this was a full-time job. One that often left all of these healers kind of outside society on the fringes of the town, usually unmarried or without their own family because this was a full-time job and they were seen as kind of bizarre and they were outside of the regular hustle and bustle of the city, town, or village. Then <laughs> things got crazy. Between the 14th and 17th century throughout Europe, we're going way back, were the original witch hunts, trials, and executions. I don't mean Salem. This is before Salem. Salem was relatively small, though no less, you know, bullshit and horrifying. And, and a few years later, but the European witch hunts lasted centuries. They killed thousands of people, mainly women, lots of healers and herbalists, and really cemented that place of women and midwives and, and people who dealt with women's health in history as witches. Their crimes were things like sexuality, inducing lust in men, possessing the power to affect health, whether it was negative or positive, even healing someone was seen as, you know, satanic witchcraft, and of being an organized group that all of these cunning women throughout Europe were all connected. They were one big coven, y'all. <laughs> Actually, you can see more about this. I just watched a documentary called uh, Witches or Witch Hunts, A Century of Murder. I found it on Netflix. Highly recommend it. And it talks about these these European witch hunts and witch trials, which, as I said, were like exceptionally <laughs> awful and gruesome. So these healers and midwives and, and cunning people were making medicines with proven ingredients, you know, natural ingredients that had been tested for years, if not centuries. And they cured ailments and issues that the church had deemed you know, things like a moral punishment handed down by God. The pain that a birthing person experiences during birth was said by the Catholic Church to be punishment for the original sin of Eve. Midwives and these healers, <laughs> they had drugs and, and herbs and chemicals to dull this pain, to make it less awful, to make birth a little bit easier. And that was seen as witchcraft because it was taking away this moral lesson from God. Uh, but to this day, many of those, many of the chemical compounds that make up our medicines were discovered and used and invented by these healers. Things like uh, ergot for pain, which is what they use during birth, which is also like the like source of LSD, the, the drug. It's If you just want to learn something really interesting, look up ergot. It comes up in witch trials again and again and again. It's a very interesting, interesting fungus. Um, and belladonna as an antispasmodic, and digitalis, which we still use in, in heart medications and things. These herbs and fungi, they still feature prominently in strictly magical books as well about herbs and witchcraft. Belladonna came up in The Witching Herbs by Harold Roth, which I absolutely loved. Loved. And a lot of the other 
herbs that these cunning women used now are almost exclusively featured in magic books. You don't really see their their medical uses anymore. You see their magical uses. And by today's standards, these cunning folk were not practicing magic. That was science. <laughs> That was that was science. They were, you know, they were testing things. They were using ingredients. They were using the properties of, of these chemicals and stuff. It was science. But of course, actual science at the time disagreed and they called it satanic magic. <laughs> Isn't that rough? Uh, and these healers, th these wonderful healers, they also made another mistake, although of course they didn't see it that way. They served everybody. No matter your finances, your station in life, if you were having a baby or were ill, or something was wrong, there was your local midwife or cunning person. Payments weren't necessarily financial. It was pay what you can. Uh, they provided these proven medicines. They helped heal the sick and the poor, much to the chagrin of upper classes, of the wealthy elite, of the Catholic Church, all of that. Side note. This is why I still consider things like healthcare reform and reproductive rights and, and abortion rights to be an inherently witchy topic. It's just so witchy. If you are a witch and you're not really thinking about this so much, I consider you, I, 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 I think you should start. <laughs> uh, so now these women on the fringes of society were not just pissing off the church with their crazy satanic witchcraft, but also the upper class and professional people. So you know, all of the most wealthy groups who ran everything. They were just, they were just pissing them right off. So at this time that these, you know, evil witches were casting science on everybody, <laughs> real doctors were working with ghosts, prayers, and actual snake juice and oil. No joke. They were, you know, grinding up snakes and giving it to people. Uh, medicine was magic and magic was medicine. This is something I've actually mentioned before. When I visited Salem, Massachusetts, I toured the witch house, which is the only structure left that was standing in 1692 and during the witch trials. And it was actually the home of a prominent judge that personally sentenced uh, people to death during these trials. So it does have that connection to, to the witch trials, but kind of from the other end. And everything in the house, you know, it was, a, it was a museum. Everything is set up the way it would have been when this prominent, very logical judge who hated magic and witchcraft and Satan lived there. And I tell you what, it was one of the most witchy places I've ever been in my entire life. Not even counting all the ghosts that were in that house, <laughs> straight up. They were hanging herbs and bones and tonics and elixirs, tons of animal fat, a giant cauldron inside a fireplace that was literally like human sized, and books on astrology and spirits and how to diagnose different physical ailments with astrology and spirits. So this flip where these less scientific methods, the things we consider magic now, became magic again, didn't happen for a very long time after this. Like like 200 years later, did all, did, did this flip of magic and medicine actually happen? During and after all of these, these witch hunts in Europe, the doctors and the Catholic Church teamed up to make medicine, or their version of medicine, a very respectable profession in their modern society, which meant setting up universities to teach it. Universities that, of course, were only open to wealthy white men. Any women, or peasants, or people of color who possessed any sort of medical type knowledge were questioned, put on trial, and even punished for not practicing with proper medical training, which of course they weren't even allowed to get. <laughs> <laughs> Just another reason the witch trials made absolutely no sense. No sense. So fast forwarding, in the 1800s in the United States, the medical establishment tried to pass these laws. I think they actually did pass laws in 13 states that tried to make it illegal for anyone without this proper, proper medical license to practice medicine. They encouraged all people to hire male obstetricians for birth and gy gynecological care especially. And that was a huge fuck up. There was a massive pushback against this. People thought it was completely obscene. Men looking up women's skirts at their secrets, the audacity, the impropriety. Plus, doctors were still using methods to treat illness that were very scary, like bloodletting and leeches and opium and humongous doses of laxatives and really toxic suppositories. Like medicine was really super scary. And visiting your local layperson healer, cunning woman, or hiring a midwife was un undoubtedly the safer option. And 
Americans didn't really fall for it the same way a lot of Europeans had. And they were like, oh, I don't know about all this. <laughs> and this sparked a huge shift in, in medical care and in reproductive rights, women's health. This is where you get the popular health movement and women's rights. This is where they come together. So in the 1830s and 40s, this time is often looked at, even now by medical professionals, as kind of the height of quackery because people were saying, you know, forget doctors. They don't actually know what they're talking about. We're going to do our own thing and, and take care of our own health. But what you actually had was these people of color, poor people, women, and all of these others who just disagreed and were fighting back. Uh, so they weren't quacks. It was <laughs> the doctors were kind of quacks at this point. Huge flip. A slogan at the time was every man his own doctor. But the movement featured and treated both men and women. Men and women became more like equals insofar as health was concerned. We're all human beings. And that really started then. People started to exercise for fitness and for fun around this time. Actually, in Me Michigan, around this time, breakfast cereal was invented as a replacement for high-fat and animal-based breakfast meals. No joke. Kellogg and Post both worked and lived in Michigan, which was the hub of the modern health movement back then. And they invented their cereals. Kellogg was a strict vegan I believe he was a member of the Church of Latter-day Saints. And so breakfast cereal is actually like, it's like the original vegan <laughs> uh, alternative meal. Super interesting. That was on one of those random documentaries I found on a channel I didn't know I got. And it was so interesting. Um, unfortunately, after a few decades, the grassroots vibe got a bit quiet. And the AMA or the American Medical Association was established. Again, relegating women in this actual science to the back of the class. Although they liked the idea of exercising for fitness. Everyone kind of agreed that that was just a good idea. <laughs> uh, from there, women had to create the profession of nursing. They had to grow it into what it is today. You know, there was the whole Florence Nightingale thing and then other nurses had to be like, Florence Nightingale wasn't actually doing anything so great. And they had to change nursing. And finally, they had to break into being doctors themselves, even in birth and women's health it's still more common to have male obstetricians and even gynecologists than it is to have female obstetricians and gynecologists now. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I mean, anyone can be trained in medical science and anyone can care about other people's health. But the reason it is like that is because of this history and because women's health and medicine was relegated to the world of witchcraft. So real science, lab work, and actual medicine joined the established medical profession and legitimized the whole operation. And here's the flip. Magic was no longer medicine for a really long time. That's, that's when this happened is when <laughs> actual science came in. <laughs> actual science started coming in um, from Germany, by the way. Uh, German doctors started doing lab work and real science, and that eventually made its way to through Europe and here to North America. Also in the last dying breaths of this, this century, the 1800s, Gerald Gardner, the first Wiccan, was born, and in a few short decades, magic would come back to us and even come back into medicine again. Neat, right? Whew. It's a big old history lesson, and I love it. So... Let's all bring it back to our point here. Midwives and doulas. What the hell are midwives and doulas? <laughs> and where did they come from? And why are so many of them to this day still tied with witches and pagans? It's been centuries since midwives were burned at the stake as witches. So why are there still so many witchy midwives and doulas? So a midwife is an actual medical professional, probably with at least a master's degree, who fills the role of a gynecologist. They deliver babies, they do pelvic exams, pre- and postnatal care, family planning, and even menopausal care. They absolutely can handle complications in birth, like, you know, surprise twins, breech babies, uh, giving vaginal births after a C-section, which a lot of doctors are just starting to do now. And it, for a long time, doctors said it wasn't even possible. Meanwhile, midwives have been... <laughs> helping women have vaginal births after c-sections for like decades and if that delivering person who's having a baby needs uh surgical type care they're recommended to an obstetrician 
or more accurately, an obstetric surgeon, which is what obstetricians are. They're a, they're a specialized kind of doctor. That's why they're not there for the entire process, if that makes sense. I mean, your heart surgeon isn't there helping you dispense medication and stuff in the beginnings uh, when you're learning <laughs> about your heart. And obst obstetricians are kind of the same. A doula, on the other hand, uh, does not have what we'd consider medical training. When I looked into becoming a midwife for myself, the program was going to be five years and it was a combo bachelor master's degree. So in other schools, it would have actually taken longer, but it was actual medical school. It was at Bastyr University in, um, in Seattle, by the way, which I still think is an awesome university. So doulas do not have that medical training. They are a helper and a support person for both the birthing person and to a lesser extent, the midwife herself. There are also doulas that work specifically with difficult births, uh, the vaginal births after cesareans, abortions, miscarriages and stillbirths, and postpartum care, like breastfeeding. Lamaze, Lamaze breathing, a lot of Lamaze breathing um, has been worked into doula work, and I believe the Lamaze Association is now certifying doulas as well. I'm not 100%, but I'm sure. Uh, so though these these helpers and have always existed when it comes to to medical care in general. There's always been a helper there. You can't do everything yourself. It's where nurses come from. We didn't first start hearing the word doula until about the 1970s. Again, the 1970s, you know, when reproductive rights for women started like, you know, busting out again. Interesting. It's a Greek word and it's a term of endearment for someone who is a helper or a servant who is specifically a woman. That's what doula means. And it came to be associated with this helper who helps during birth work. And now it's, you know, the word. And of course, there are training and certification courses. I have one and I have a very cute little certificate to prove it that's still on my wall. But not all doulas are certified and not all of them learned through a school or a class. And some of them learned through experience, which is very much like um, the midwives and helpers of yore back in the day. It, even if there's no accepted training, it's something that, these people know is necessary, know it works, know it helps. And so they learn through experience and through trial and error. Error. The main goal and charge of the doula is to help the birthing person, mostly emotionally. It was driven home when I became a doula. You are there to recognize distress, to utilize techniques to help women lead the birthing process along. Uh, like breathing, yoga, different birthing positions, calming them down, meeting their emotional and physical needs, being a cheerleader, and also stuff like tossing out trash, getting your hand squeezed so hard you break a finger, and making sure that the non-birthing partner doesn't go totally off the deep end and freak out. <laughs> Straight up. I love the non-birthing partners. I think they're so wonderful. It's also about being clear-headed uh, and educated an educated advocate for the birthing person to make sure that they have the birth process that they want safely. Doulas sometimes are like the big bouncer at the door in a lot of birthing rooms, whether that's in the hospital or at home or whatever. And since emotional support is such a huge part of being a doula, spiritual support often comes into play. Most of the doulas I know, even if they aren't open witches or pagans are well versed in prayers, meditations, yoga, and even tons of different religious and spiritual customs, philosophies surrounding birth. So after hearing the history of magic and medicine, I don't think it's really surprising uh, that doulos, midwives, and witches are so closely intertwined. But I also know I'm only one person. <laughs> My experience isn't the whole of the doula experience. So I decided to ask some practicing midwives and doulas and parents who are all witches or spiritual practitioners about their own ideas about the connection there. I got a lot of really, really cool responses to a, a survey I put out there, both for parents who are spiritual practitioners and people who work as midwives and doulas and are spiritual practitioners. And it was really neat. A hundred percent of the doulas and midwives that uh, answered my survey, 100% of the practicing midwives and doulas also identified as witches. Some also identified as pagan, or spiritual practitioner, parent, um, <laughs> a few other things, but 100% identified as witches. I thought that was really neat and kind of funny. Likewise, every single parent that I talked to was the parent that had given birth and was not the, the partner parent. And 
90% of them said they were witches, with a lot more saying pagan or spiritual practitioner, but 90% said we're witches. So the question, are all doulas and midwives witches? I want to say no, <laughs> because they aren't all mid uh, witches, but a lot of them are a lot. Very, very cool. With every single one of these, these people, both the the parents and the birth workers, I asked which came first, your spirituality or your interest in birth work? And again, 100% of the people who answered the survey said that their interest in spirituality, especially things like paganism, witchcraft, and alternative spiritualities came first. 100%. And that was really great because for me, it was the same way. Even though I wasn't a practicing witch or pagan at the time, that I became or started getting interested in becoming a doula. Getting interested in doula work got me more interested again in spirituality. When I asked if they believed if their, you know, their interest in spirituality had anything to do with their interest in birth work, again, most of the people said yes. If you said no, you know, it's just they believe it's a coincidence. I don't really think it's a coincidence, but they do. And that's cool. But a lot of these people who answered my survey agree that their their spirituality and their interest or their work in birth work is intrinsically tied. Uh, one person said becoming a doula definitely had some ties to my being a witch, ties that even I was unable to identify until years into my practice and a couple years as a doula. I'm incredibly passionate about reproductive rights, which I came to learn is tied to a past life that I've always felt rather stuck on. I love this comment because it's very, very interesting. Not only is it, you know, a past life that you're very stuck on, but this is such an intrinsic part of the history of witchcraft and being someone who is a witch and who has felt as a witch forever. Having this passion about reproductive rights, I think is, is <laughs> like I said, it's very natural. Reproductive rights and the fight for medical reform is very, very witchy. Uh, another person said, I think they reinforce each other historically and practically. To attend births is to sit in a gateway, whether you acknowledge it as such or not. It's life and death. I find the archetype of the witch assists me in my work of retaining the traditional scope and model of midwifery care while training and working in the medical model. I'm a better midwife because of my witchcraft. Another person even said at the time, I probably would have said no. But looking back, I can definitely see that I was guided and called to this work in much the same way as my spirituality. I love that. <laughs> I asked parents and birth workers if they feel that working in natural birth or birth workers has affected their spiritual practice or beliefs in any way. And a lot of people actually said no. <laughs> and not just a straight no. Like everyone, everyone <laughs> explained it. No one just said no. They said, I wouldn't say that it has changed my beliefs or practices. It more just opened my eyes to what a spiritual experience the labor and delivery can be. My main reason for birthing at home with a midwife was that I didn't want pain medication or unnecessary interventions. I wanted to be totally sober, sober and safe. Much like the reasons during the popular health movement in the 1800s is that this this way of, you know, working with your health is just feels more safe to them. Uh, someone else said it has just made my spiritual beliefs more concrete. I find that most of the other women in my spiritual circles are in birth work. It's hard to see that the miracles birthing women can do and not have an immediate belief in power and natural magic from within. I love that and I, I firmly agree. I think seeing something like just this un this experience of humanity that we're so cut off from that we normally don't see, that we normally don't interact with until we're right in the thick of it, seeing that really, really makes you realize how wild the experience of humanity can be and how magical everyday moments and everyday events can really be and feel. 
A lot of other doulas and midwives said the same thing I said. They said it didn't really change their spiritual practice, practice since it was already kind of established. But what it did was add new elements to it. A lot of them cited that they started working with herbs more, herbs that are commonly associated with reproductive health or women's health. Herbs like the ones I found in, in Susan Weed's book, which I also started working with more regularly in my witchcraft practice as a result of learning about them, their medical uses in, in birth work. I asked these witchy parents about their spiritual beliefs and about their doulas and midwives and if they were open about their spirituality with their birth work or if they wanted to incorporate it into their birth plan. Uh, when I asked if anyone incorporated any elements of their spiritual beliefs into their birth plan, again, 100% said yes. <laughs> 100% said yes, that they incorporated some of their spirituality into their birth plan. With quite a few people saying one of the main reasons I chose a home birth was so that I could bring in that spiritual element that made me feel safe, that made me feel powerful, that made me feel like it was going to be a better experience. Most of them, again, were open about their spirituality with their doula and midwife. Only one person said no, but it's not because they were afraid. No one said they were afraid that mentioning their spirituality to their birth worker would negatively affect their care or relationship. The only person, one person said no. They were like, no, but I just, I just didn't really think about it. I did my own thing and didn't feel I had to explain myself to them, which is badass. <laughs> one comment was really cool. My doulas worked in a group of three who took turns being in, on call. Their group was actually united by their Christian beliefs. But I explained to them and my midwife practice that I am a witch, and I wanted to emphasize labor and birth as a sacred rite of passage. And they didn't even bat an eyelash. They just asked that I give them specific instructions ahead of time of how I wanted them to support me and where in the house they could find any necessary equipment like smudge sticks and specially charged essential oil blends. Wonderful. Another comment said both my midwives were Christian, but had worked with pagan mamas before and were very respectful and encouraging of my beliefs. Uh, my midwife was Hindu, so we had a lot of nice discussions about our beliefs, and she was very open-minded about my birth plan and actually asked for music recommendations afterwards. My doulas were all pagan as well, which was a little bit funny to me. It wasn't on purpose. So interesting. And when I asked the birth workers, if they are open about their spirituality with their clients, 100% said yes. 100% said yes. My spirituality is a part of my business. Straight up. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Their doula or midwifery practice is absolutely rooted in their spirituality. Uh, one person said, I was in a partnership with another witch friend and we were named Sinavali Dula, who my partner described as a goddess. Now that we've parted ways, I'm trying to incorporate some kind of goddess into my new name for my practice. And I cannot, for the life of me, figure one out. So if anyone has a good recommendation of an empowering goddess or deity that this person can use in their, their doula work here, I would love it if you would throw it out to me on social media somewhere and I can pass it along. Uh, Another one said, in general, I'm just not a fan of hiding major aspects of myself or other people's basically irrational societal standards. I'm open, but not in your face. Yes, I'm a witch, but I'm also an omnist theatist who can recite the Lord's Prayer with you if that's what you, if that's what helps you through your contractions. A bi nice big answer that I loved. Yes, I hid my spirituality for a long time, along with my sexuality, but made the choice a couple years ago to bridge the gap between personal and professional, to present an accurate and authentic self to my community. I believe that birth happens best when the birthing person is in alignment with their caregiver, which is near impossible in today's maternity care context, where caregivers often work in large teams and follow widespread clinic policies that may limit birthing people's access to options and rights to, the, to bodily autonomy. I just want to take a minute to say whoever wrote this. I mean, you're so articulate here. <laughs> Do you have a podcast? Because I'd listen. Uh, <laughs> I want my clients to be able to peek into my life, see my values and understand who I am to decide whether or not that works for them before we enter into a relationship together. I do this through my writing, my website, and through Instagram, since this is where the majority of witchy clues about my life live. I'm a full spectrum student midwife intent on building a community and socially safe, inclusive solo practice upon my graduation to give the best care and show up for my community the way that I'm being asked for. I have to show up as my whole self. 
that is just such an amazing and beautiful answer to that because it's this it's this acknowledgement that spirituality has a place in working with medicine with health <laughs> and with reproductive and women's rights and here's the fun stuff finally i asked every parent uh, midwife and doula if they believed that doulas and midwives were more popular in pagan or witchy circles and communities and why they think that is and again almost every single one i think one person from each group said no or i haven't noticed everyone else said yes and the reasons for that are things like midwifery is a very old and spiritual tradition what do we have here i can't say for sure but i would assume yes i can only speak for myself but i think for me and for many of us one, we value and are connected to nature. So we have an interest in, in keeping our health as natural as possible. And the midwife philosophy that, that birth is a natural physiological event as opposed to a scary medical emergency resonates with us. And two, we are feminists and don't want our power and agency taken away from us in a hospital environment where we may be pressured or coer coerced into medically unnecessary interventions rather than being able to make our own decisions for ourselves and our children. And three, maybe other witches also want to be in an atmosphere that is more conducive to spiritual and magical birth and health experiences. I love this. And this person, you nailed it. These are all the same reasons, aside from this historical connection, that I believe midwifery and doula work and all sorts of birth work, whether you're working with abortions or um you know, stillbirths, uh, babies that are being born, postnatal care. All of that is something that is just, it's so, it's so outside of what we consider to be normal and natural and the things we talk about in society. It is a little bit fringe, oddly enough. And it's also midwifery and doulaism, like I said, are a lot about offering options and education and activacy which is <laughs> like a big part of witchcraft. That is what we're about. We are about finding our own power. We are about being educated and learning the things that we need, whether or not the, the dominant culture thinks they're important. This is all true for both witchcraft and, and for midwives and doulas. So I think that's really, really interesting. Of course, pagans and witches are also in tune with nature and natural cycles they already worship or understand the concept of goddesses and the divine feminine so they understand the power of a circle of people supporting one another through these big powerful life altering mind stones milestones sorry and i had to laugh at this one answer very short and sweet <laughs> i don't know but all my midwife and doula friends are also my coven <laughs> and this is the truth for me all of the midwives and doulas uh, that I know now that I'm, I'm still connected with, I didn't meet any of them through being a doula. I met all of them through local pagans and witches, and most of them were in my own um, pagan and, and, and witchy practicing group. Actually, a few of the people who answered these questions were in my own <laughs> practicing witch group. So very, very interesting. Uh, <laughs> very, very interesting connection. I think I keep saying it, but it's it's very, very con interesting how connected these things still are. And it only makes sense to me, but there are still people asking why, 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 why does this happen? And so I also asked, why do you work as a doula or midwife? Why is that important to you? And, and what do you get out of it? And it's, I loved these answers. My favorite was, it's my passion. And that's the answer to all of those questions. <laughs> Beautiful. Witchy. Uh, another one said, I believe that every woman has the right to an autonomous birth. I don't really get anything out of it. I try to just change the world one birth at a time. Very lovely. I witnessed the birth of my brother when I was 10 years old. And to this day, it's one of the coolest experiences of my life. Later, when I was a teenager, I experienced the flip side of that with a major need for my own reproductive rights. Now I'm in this work because the two things that matter most to me as a doula are choice and support. As for what I get out of it, hope for the future, plain and simple. I loved it. I loved the answers I got to this, this survey 
and these questions. I just, I just loved it. I love how relatable it was to me as both a witch and a doula, and even as someone who's no longer in the sphere in the sphere of birth work. Uh, as I said, I needed all of that, but it wasn't something I could do professionally for me. I don't know if you guys have noticed. I'm a little bit more of an academic than I am in actually going out and doing stuff. In practice, I was not a good doula. <laughs> it sucks, but it's the truth. But that connection I have with birth workers, doulas, midwives, uh, abortion workers, all of that has never gone away and, and has actually been strengthened through my work as a witch, even though I'm, I'm a child-free person. <laughs> Child free, totally child free. I don't even, you know, always love kids. And despite that, I, I get along with and I relate to a lot of these people who work in birth work and are loving babies and loving being moms and, you know, crunchy hippie moms, which is just not quite who I am. But we all share this tether to this history of oppressed people, oppressed women, reproductive rights and fighting for our own selves, our own body, our own identities, and our own lives. And that is really why there are so many witchy and pagan midwives and doulas, and why so many witchy and pagan parents hire and work with midwives and doulas, because they recognize this kinship. So interesting. So before I, I close things up here, I just want to point out um, a lot of what you hear about midwives and doulas is entirely in like a home birth situation. You do not have to give birth at home with no drugs to have a midwife or doula. There are absolutely midwives and doulas that will go to the hospital, you know, They'll let the, that anesthesiologist come in here and pump you full of drugs, and they can still help you through the entire process. They can still help you breastfeed after if you want to, or if you don't want to, that's okay. The point of birth work and of midwives and doulas to, is to offer choice. And the choice you pick is your own, and it doesn't matter. So if you've been listening to this and you, and you think, yeah, but I... <laughs> I don't want to even like, you know, be there. I, I want to be full of drugs. I want to be in a hospital. I feel safer in a hospital. I want nurses and doctors. That's okay. You can combine these two things. You can have your midwife and doula who is offering you uh, your emotional and spiritual support and a more um, like a witchier version <laughs> of obstetric or gynecological care and also have, you know, your clean, polished hospital room and your wonderful and <laughs> knowledgeable and overworked nurses who are cousins to the midwives and doulas for sure for sure you can have all of that stuff it's open to everyone even if you're not witchy you can get yourself christian midwives and doulas so there you have it witches midwives and doulas why they're connected, how they became connected, how the game split up and got back together again, how medicine became magic. It's all very, very interesting. If you want to learn a little bit more about all of this stuff, I've got a long list of sources. So let's start. I, the Birth House by Amy McKay, although it is uh, a work of historical fiction, she actually lives in a birth house in Nova Scotia and did a lot of very real research. And the book features a lot of really cool recipes and poems and things um, from these granny midwives. Uh, Witches, Midwives, and Nurses by Barbara Ironrich and Deidre English, which you can still get from the Feminist Press at the City University of New York. The Wise Woman Herbal for the Childbearing Year by Susan Weed. Susan Weed is the coolest herbalist in the world. In the world! Uh, Basic Witches by Jaya Saxena and Jess Zimmerman, uh, which is, as I mentioned before, a modern take on some secular witchcraft. Witches, Sluts, and Feminists by Kristen J. Soleil, which is my new favorite nonfiction book of all time. It is like, I wish I could just hand it to people when they ask who I am because <laughs> it's everything I am in one book. I highly recommend it. 
If you want to learn a little bit more about the popular health movement, the documentary that I mentioned was actually an episode of Modern Marvels, which is made by the History Channel, called Physical Fitness. And it talks mostly about gyms and physical fitness. It starts in ancient Greece, obviously, with the Olympics and the stadiums there, and moves up to the Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan with Dr. Kellogg and Post. (laughs) And their serial invention and, and their veganism and their wacky uh, medical treatments, some of which are less science and a little bit more magic, even in the 1800s there. So if you want to watch that, I highly recommend looking it up because it was very, very interesting. And finally, The Story of Jane by Laura Kaplan, which is a nonfiction book. It is an actual memoir about um, Jane, the abortion collective, but it's written in a way that it almost feels like you're reading a fictional story. It's not written from a first person account. Laura Kaplan, the author, gives herself a a fake name within the story so as not to detract you from, you know, relating to all of the people and all of the activists that are in the story. It wasn't about her. It was about all of these people. Really super highly recommend. And of course, a very special thank you to everyone who answered the survey and shared your stories and your experiences and your thoughts with us. A few people left their names. So thank you to Aria, Alicia Marie of Drawing Down the Moon Doula Services, to Lisa, to Emily Innes of Sacred Space, and I know she's here in Windsor, to Pam, aka the Pop Witch, Anna, Kyla, Julia from Berlin, and Saturnine, as well as Jade. Again, two women that I know from my own pagan experience. Thank you all so much for your answers and for sharing your experiences. I I really enjoyed reading them all, even if they didn't get read here in the episode. So thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast for this episode about witches, midwives, and doulas. If you like the show and you want to support the show, you can go to my website at fatfeministwitch.com. You can read the blog and you can also support me by buying me a coffee or joining my Patreon page for special sub- sub- subscribers. That's not starting again until September, but you can, of course, check it out now. You can always contact me online at fatfeministwitch at gmail.com or across social media. I love Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, especially. I'm I'm addicted to Twitter right now, and I even use Pinterest and sometimes Tumblr. I have a Google Plus page too, but I don't know if anyone's checking for that. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday, rest of your week, and rest of your summer. And of course, bon fête à tous mes amis acadiens. Very excited that is your day, and I'm very excited that I got to speak just a little bit of um, my awful broken French here on the show. So I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the summer, and I hope you tune into the next episode of the Fat Feminist Witch Podcast, and I hope in the meantime, you all stay magical and explore your spirituality and what being a witch means to you. <laughs>